Open your Bible to the book of Nehemiah, right in the middle of the Old Testament, right before you get to the book of Psalm. You'll find Nehemiah just a few pages before then. It is so good to be back with you. I have missed you, and it was a needed several weeks. The girls and I had a great time together. We were able to visit some other churches, be blessed by being able to receive God's Word for several weeks. Really enjoyed our time, but boy, did we ever miss you. And we're so glad we're back, and what an exciting time this is. August the 1st, we've been looking forward to this day for several, several months. The day that we come back into so many um, important things within our church, able to enjoy these study groups and all the work that Pastor Adam has done to make sure that our Sunday school is alive and vibrant after such a hard and a strenuous and a strange season. But boy, today has just been wonderful in those respects. And I'm just so glad each of you are here. I'm glad for the 11 o'clock service time. Don't you kind of like it? Um, it was nice. I was looking at my watch and it was 1050, wondering why have we not started? And then I remembered. And so I'm just glad that we get to have this time together this morning, that we get to open up God's Word. I'm so thankful for such a capable and wonderful um, ministerial team that we have here at our church. They have worked so diligently. I mentioned Pastor Adam, his work in the all that he's done with our, our Sunday school and our, our, our study groups getting launched today. But aren't you thankful for the way that he opened up God's word to you for these last several weeks? I was so blessed. Hey, I was so blessed to, 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 to get online and to listen to him preach. And it was just a joy to be able to do that. I'm so glad we get to be together. Well, Nehemiah chapter 1 is we are where we are today. It is time for us to get to work. God has steered me to this book as we're looking at this season, this fall that is so important in the life of our church. I'm so glad that we will get to study this book together. Let's pray as we get started and ask God's blessing. Father, we come to you today so thankful. Just as Pastor Jeff so rightfully read to us from Psalm 122, it, we, it was so, we are so glad that they said unto us, let us come into the house of the Lord. And Lord, after a season that we remember what it was like to not be able to come together for a short time, we are so thankful that we are here to receive your word. And as we open it up, as we consider the needs of the world around us, this incredible mission that you've called our church to embrace and to live out and to fulfill for your glory. Father, I pray that our hearts will be just inflamed as we study your word today. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the Tokyo Olympics so far. Had it been fun? I have loved watching these swimmers do what they've done and break world records and watch the, the challenges of the girls' gymnastics team. I mean, Simone Biles, I wish she could have competed, but boy, wasn't it great to see how that team has rallied and done so well. I love the Olympics. Do you like it? Isn't it fun to watch? Aren't you a bit tired every morning as you're staying up like I am probably till 12, 30, 1 in the morning? Because even though you've probably already gotten the spoilers on the internet, you just want to see how, the, how our team has done and how hard our team have worked and the fruit of all of their labor. Boy, it has been so much fun just to watch the Olympics this last week. But can I tell you while I've watched it, every time I turn it on, there's an interesting reminder of the times that we're in. Have you noticed the way that it's branded all throughout? It's wherever you see the, the, the branding for the Olympics, you see Tokyo 2020. And every time I see that, I have to check my calendar and make sure that my memory is correct because we're not in 2020 anymore, are we? And just the times that you turn it on and you see the mention of Tokyo 2020, the fact that it was a whole year that the Olympics had to be delayed. Every single time you see that branding and the timestamp 2020, it lets you know something has happened. And so it is when we read the time stamping in the book that we're going to study together. Nehemiah is time stamped to let us know that God has worked in this time period in a remarkable and a wonderful way. And that is why we read Psalm 122 together. If you remember back 
um, in the history of Israel, that the temple of God was destroyed at the hands of King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians in 586 B.C. That meant that after the destruction of the temple, that God's people had to put their worship in the temple on pause for generations. But then, they must have been ecstatic when they were able to once again sing the songs originally penned by David. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. The second temple was built. That's what we read about in the book of Ezra. But the ecstasy of the temple's finishing, that ecstasy was short-lived. Nehemiah, living in Susa, which is the winter capital of Persia, he asked his brothers at the beginning of Nehemiah chapter 1 to give the report to him of the state of affairs in Jerusalem. And Nehemiah's brother and his entourage, they answer Nehemiah, the remnant there in the province, those who have survived the exile, are in great trouble and shame. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down. And the gates, they have been destroyed by fire. So right at the beginning of Nehemiah chapter 1, our book begins with a note of deep and great concern. And don't you sense in your heart a similar urgency as you walk through this season together? The, The people of God who are living in the city of Jerusalem were severely threatened as they lived out their days without the protection of the city of Jerusalem's walls. And I don't claim to understand in full what it must have felt like to live in Jerusalem in these conditions. But today, I've got to tell you, I feel like I understand it as much as I ever have before. During my sabbatical, I got to read a lot of great books. And one of the books that I really enjoyed reading is a book that was released just a few months ago by Mark Hearn, who is the pastor of First Baptist Church, Duluth, Georgia, right around the corner from us. And that book is entitled Hearing in Technicolor. And in that book, Hearn not only reports the gripping statistic that thousands of our Southern Baptist churches are closing, their churches, evangelical churches rather, are closing every year, but he also concludes that this pace is only going to accelerate if churches and congregations are not willing to make the drastic changes they need to do to reach the communities around them. And he supports his view by pointing his readers to the situation of churches right here in Atlanta, Georgia. He gives a statistic that I'll always remember. In 1966, there were 166 Southern Baptist churches inside of the perimeter in Atlanta. But of those 166 churches in this year, only 31 of those churches exist today. And Pastor Hearn continues that he points out the urgent situation that not only has now found churches within the perimeter, the perimeter of Atlanta within, but now SB churches that are located beyond Atlanta's perimeter are experiencing the same challenges. He feels them in his church there in Duluth, Georgia. And we right here in places just like Smyrna are feeling these things too. So when we consider these truths, the remainder of Nehemiah chapter 1 becomes as important as it ever has. Won't you read with me Nehemiah's response when he hears the awful news of the condition of his countrymen in Jerusalem? He says in verse 2, As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, 
the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that now, I now pray to you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We've acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, then your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven. From there, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will make them and bring them in the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was cupbearer to the king. I'm so thankful, church, for these verses. Nehemiah gives us a shining example of what it looks like to possess two things in the same time. And it's important that we always remember these things. They've got to be held together. We must possess a genuine passion for the glory of God while also possessing a sincere compassion for those who are living their lives far removed from God's benefits. This is the beautiful intersection where theology and where good faithful ministry, where they come together. So as we read this opening chapter in Nehemiah, I want you to understand that greatness for our church will begin where greatness began back in Nehemiah's day. It's when the people of God embrace the truth that mourning and fasting and prayer precede authentic movements of God. What a profound message that Nehemiah gives to us. But can I tell you that I think this is a me message that is rarely understood and rarely heard in today's culture? I mean, we want to be on the bandwagon of something that seems to be successful, don't we? We want to be a part of a cause that's already shown that it is worthwhile and worthy of our attention. But Nehemiah shows us something completely different. That the most satisfying service that we can offer the Lord is often born out of the darkness of trouble and shame. So Nehemiah weeps, the text says, when he learns of what's happening in Jerusalem because he is identifying with the anguish of his fellow countrymen. He is fasting as we read this text. Because he has spiritual longing that is intense for his people's well-being. And he's praying. Even though he's surrounded by all the pagan idols of the Persians. But he's praying knowing that his God is the only true resident of heaven who has the power, according to Psalm 115 verse 3, to do whatever he so chooses and pleases. So as we read this text, I've just got a question for you this morning. Do you want your life and energy to make this kind of difference for God's kingdom? If so, as you mourn with me, as you fast with each other, as we pray for God to use us, as we spend that time in his presence, God is going to teach us several lessons that we learned that he taught to Nehemiah. And what we'll see, beginning in verse 5 and following, is that God will show us that we must empathize with the pain that true suffering brings. I don't want you to miss this important detail in verse 4. Because the Bible tells us that after learning of the dire condition of his fellow Jews who had returned from exile and who are now living in Israel, the Bible says that Nehemiah mourned, he fasted, and he prayed. And I want you to see, this wasn't something that happened for just 30 minutes and then he went home. It happened continually in his life for days. 
He continued in his pattern according to the first verse of Nehemiah 1 in the month of Chislev, which is the month of November and December in the calendar that Nehemiah is basing this on. So this is about our timetable of a, something that began in his life around November, December. It's a winter month, and he stays in this condition through the fourth month of Nisan that we read about in the very next chapter, Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1. So for four months, we find Nehemiah mourning. We find him fasting for God to move. We find him praying for his people and for what he needs to do. And while he's in that place for four months, don't you wonder why in the world anyone would want to leave that place of deep, intimate communion with the Lord? As we read what we learn about Nehemiah's prayer life, the God to whom he prays, according to Nehemiah, not only makes covenantal promises with his children, but in all of the power of heaven, this God to whom he prays doesn't just make promises, but he keeps them. Not just some of them, church. He keeps all of them. And this God, his love, it is steadfast. And that lets us know that the God of heaven to whom Nehemiah prays, that we can also pray, this God can be trusted because in his perfection, his love for us is infinite, it is eternal, and it never changes. And the only accept, acceptable response then of us to this promise-keeping, steadfastly loving God should only be one thing, unquestionable obedience. I mean, when you realize the fullness of the God of Nehemiah chapter 1, how can you respond to this God in any way but to choose to obey? We know that God's law is given to us from the beginning and it is given to us for a reason. All of God's law brings Him glory, but it is also for our own good. Why would we ever question those things? But still, in Nehemiah chapter 1, we still find Nehemiah confessing his personal sin. We find him confessing the sin of his family and even confessing on behalf of his Jewish countrymen who are suffering in Jerusalem. You see, what I find to be true in Nehemiah chapter 1 is he spent time with the Lord in prayer. He's not distinguished in a way that separates him from other sinners. Instead, he is identified as being one of those sinners in need of the forgiveness that only God can give him. In sin, it is always the cause of suffering. The only reason we face suffering in this world is because sin exists in this world. So Nehemiah, knowing that suffering is caused by sin, brokenness is caused by sin, he confesses that sin and the sin of his people. Now I want you to remember this and remember a takeaway that you'll find in Nehemiah chapter 1 that's got such implications for us. Empathy, the concern that we have with others, and seeing them hurt, and being willing to get in the ditch with them and love them in the face of their hurt, empathy and confession of sin are both used by God to fuel faithful ministry. And if you don't have both of them, you likely won't serve the Lord as faithfully as you ought. And so do we, church, really understand how to identify with the hurting and minister in this way? Nehemiah is in such a place of privilege, isn't he? The capital city of Susa. He's living comfortably. He is far removed from the trouble and the shame that his brothers report is happening back in Jerusalem. And it would be tempting if you're in his shoes to truly care for the, his countrymen by praying for them. But then, wouldn't it be tempting to leave the rescue and restoration in the hands of another and assume that's someone else's job. But church, we're going to see as the book of Nehemiah plays out, that is not Nehemiah's way. And can I tell you this morning, that cannot be our way either. These aren't easy days that we're living in. 
But I do want to stop and recognize the prosperity that our community is experiencing right now. This past week, Josh Winkles and I sat with each other as we attended the Mayor's State of the City Address. And it is easy to argue, based on what we are hearing and what we are seeing, that this time in our city's history is as economically strong as it has ever been. But can I tell you, even in the face of this, there is an awful underbelly to the way that our city is advancing. Because while you have this financial economic success going on, church, homelessness is on the rise too. Can't even get in your car and ride up and down Atlanta Road without seeing people with carts trying to find some semblance of a safe place that they can rest. Loneliness is so pervasive. As we're coming out of a pandemic that everyone has been separated, it is devastating people. Insecurity of who they are. Identity confusion in our culture today, believing what our culture is telling others about who they are. All of these things are true. And as I see these things, the effects of all of these ancient enemies that are all around us are as deep and are as awful as they have ever been. And in the power of the gospel that God has given us, church, when we see these things around us, this isn't someone else's mission. We can't just stay comfortable. This is our mission. And Smyrna has quickly become one of the most ethnically diverse and youngest demographics in our state. And it's filled with a whole lot of people that see life way differently than we do. And we all pray that we want to see our community reached. But here's the challenge. Don't assume, then, that as we pray those things, that is someone else's mission to take up. God wants for you and I to empathize with people who need him, to get in the ditch with them, and remember what it is to suffer and how it is to be far from God. And as we identify and minister to those who suffer, we pray for these friends that they will receive the gospel, and we do so with a sincere love as we pray for them with tireless fervor. So we've got to pray prayers of confession and empathy. But along with empathizing with the pain that suffering brings, there's something else we learn from Nehemiah. We must align our prayers with the promises of God. I'm struck by the content of Nehemiah's prayers in chapter 1. They show his understanding of the Word of God, They show his understanding of the times that he's in, his deep understanding of the history of his own people. And when you think about how the Bible shows us what happened in Israel's history, the history of Israel up until the time of Nehemiah, it truly reads like a prophesied train wreck. God promises to Moses, as we read of these promises all through the first five books of the Bible, and especially in the book of Deuteronomy, that if God's people obey, life and blessings will be given to them in abundance from the Lord. But if God's people grow comfortable, if they get self-reliant, if they abandon God's law and live lives marked by sin and by idolatry, the curse of the Lord will surely follow And when you think about the history of Israel, even if you have very little knowledge of the Old Testament, you know how the story of Israel goes because you know how that same story goes within your own heart. And God loved Israel enough to send to them prophet after prophet, but eventually, because their hearts were turned away, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 17, they lost their home. And as our text says in Nehemiah 1, they were scattered. But no matter how far Israel had fallen or how dark Israel's sin had become, God's arm was never too short to save. So listen to the hope of verse 9. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. 
And none of this comes from Nehemiah's own strength or from his might. All of this redemption, it all comes from God. And the same God who chose to use a pagan king of Babylon to bring his discipline against his people in 586 B.C., that same God promises to redeem his children by his great power and by his strong hand. So I want to ask you, are you praying for the repentance and the return and the forgiveness of your neighbors? Do you long for Acts chapter 3 verses 17 through 19 to be fulfilled and transform the lives of people all throughout our city? As in Acts chapter 3, Peter proclaims, And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as, you all, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, this as Christ would suffer, he thus fulfills. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed to you, Jesus. So from Nehemiah, we learn so much. We learn the close connection in our prayer closet between empathy and confession. We learn that God wants to know of the promises that he makes of his... uh, wants us to know of the promises that he makes in his word and to pray for the fulfillment of those promises. But this chapter has another charge for us this morning because in the very last verse we learn that God wants us to do as Nehemiah and find our place in God's story of redemption. When Nehemiah set out at the beginning of this season of his life, these four months of mourning and fasting and praying, His heart was broken, but he didn't know at the beginning what it was God was calling him to do. But during this time in the presence of the Lord, God showed and revealed to Nehemiah his plan. And by the end of the chapter, he knows, as sure as the fact that he is living, that he has a role to play in the story, and that God's going to use him to boldly approach the king. And this is why Nehemiah reveals his divinely appointed occupation, not at the beginning of chapter 1, but there at the very end, as he states, now I was cupbearer to the king. A cupbearer is a significant position in Artaxerxes' courtroom. And God had placed this Israelite of all people, a man whose very name, Nehemiah, literally means the compassion of Jehovah to become the leader to secure the walls of Jerusalem and reclaim the city's strength and security. Now, I don't want to underestimate the giftedness of Nehemiah. He is a person of incredible personal acumen, but isn't this striking? The instrument that God will use to reclaim Jerusalem's strength after exile, he isn't a priest. He's not a local warrior, but God's instrument is a king's official born and raised in the far-off capital city of Susa. In fact, you've got to cross a whole lot of land to get from Susa to Jerusalem. There's this big problem that you encounter if you travel called the Arabian Desert that you've got to get around if you're ever going to make your way to the city of Jerusalem. So God placed this Israelite over with Artaxerxes in this capital city to be the instrument that he's going to use. Do you know that God's at work in a similar way right here in this room? We have everybody within the sound of my voice this morning who are everybody from tree removers to record drivers to teachers to city officials, to lawyers, people who do all of these different things in these different places, CDC employees, all of these folks have occupations. We all have occupations that God has given us to do different things. 
But though our occupations are different, every single one of us have been given the same mission and the same calling from Jesus. And God wants us to be the very best version of who we are in our professional life, just as Nehemiah was that to the king, so that our influence can then be leveraged to bring glory and honor to him. And this is ultimately why God has placed you in the workplace that you're in. This is why your house happens to be in the community that you're living within. It's because God has sovereignly decided to use you, just like he's using Nehemiah in our text, as an instrument to fulfill his redemptive purposes in this world. So my question for you, now that you know that you're a part of God's grand story, is how are you stewarding this truth? What are you doing with this influence? Well, the days that we are living in, these are hard days. People all around us, just like these Jews that Nehemiah receives the report from, who have returned from exile, are feeling vulnerable and totally exposed. Sin has led to such suffering in their lives that their lives have been ransacked and devastated. And when people in our community are living in a state of continual trouble and shame, their only hope is for the Lord who is the rescuer to send them his rescue to address their brokenness and pick their lives up from the From the debris. And this is what happens when we bring to people the hope of the gospel. The same God who sent a cupbearer wants to send you. Are you ready? I want to ask you to bow your head, close your eyes. Before you can serve Jesus, you have to know him. And if you have entered in this place without a relationship with him, I pray that today the eyes of your heart have been awakened and have been made to see that Christ is everything the Bible says that he is. The only hope of eternal life is found in your relationship with Jesus. And if you're here today without knowing him, won't you this morning confess that you're a sinner in no way of saving yourself without any hope in the world in your own resources and totally just throw yourself upon the grace of Christ. Receive the gospel that Jesus came and he lived and he died on the cross for our sins so he'd be raised from the dead, conquering sin and death forever. If you need him, won't you receive that truth today and receive Christ? I hope that we'll leave this place with a desire to see our community the way that God wants us to. A community in deep need of the grace that only he can provide. Won't you ask where your place is in this redemptive story? God, I thank you for this time. As we sing of your amazing grace, Lord, I pray that that grace will be extended from this place, that more and more can see it and see how beauty, beautiful it is to receive it and to be forever transformed and changed by it. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.